All right, we should be live again. And sh people should be able to see this stream, which is pretty epic. Um, let's see if uh, there's a loop. No. Oh, okay. It's been solved. There you go. The tomb is no longer invading the stream, which is nice. Easy We're going to invade the tomb instead. Which is I sure hope so. Cool. Board game heaven. Hey. How's it going? We'll just wait a couple seconds for folks to jump into the game. We should be all set up here. We're going to be playing two players today. Myself and Cooper will be playing here. We're going to explore the tomb in the Pharaoh with the Blue Eyes. If I am have, no longer uh, Cooper. The game before, I am James T. Before. Temple. Yes, indeed. James T. Temple. And I will be Bianca Sinclair. Can I always felt you looked like Bianca. <laughs> exactly. These are our characters here. Hello. Can everybody hear me and Cooper in the chat here? Hi, everybody. All right. My voice volume is a little low. I'll just have to speak up for now, I guess, until I... Thank you, Board Game Heaven. Until I learn how to become a better streamer, which is not going to happen overnight. <laughs> so... All right, we're going to jump in in just about 30 seconds, and uh, we are going to jump into the tomb here, as I said, with two players. We're going to be playing the Pharaoh with the Blue Eyes scenario. We're going to do about a full round of the game to give everybody a quick demo of how the game plays, and uh, we're going to go through all of the rules you'll need to know to play. Of course, every scenario has its own unique rules, you know. Uh, that's kind of uh, the the best part about the game, is that every scenario um, is unique. You will see that the scenario book we're using here is the old version of the scenario book. So it has older icons, old art in it. And you'll see that the icons in the game here, if you look closely at the new player reference card, uh, the new icons look a little bit different from the old icons, but I'll go over them when they come up and point out the fact that some of them are a little bit extra different, like the scenario triggered effects are a little bit cleaner, which is a good thing, but it also um, potentially could cause a little bit of confusion, and we don't want that until we have an actual final game here to go. So, uh, Yes, uh, Russ, the, uh, what we're playing today is of course going to be in the new rules, but again, um, as everybody has uh, has wanted, uh, we have changed very little in this version of the game. Um, we are just mostly cleaning up a lot of uh, old things from 10 years ago. Most of the graphic design is all updated and cleaned up. Um, and we will do a little bit of the new spirit monger spirit track here. We'll track our spirits here along the track. And we will read in the new story with Cleopatra. Which is, um, which is pretty cool. So you'll get to see a little bit of that as well. So we'll go over how Cleopatra can help us here in the scenario with uh, the fair with the blue eyes, which is pretty cool. I'm going to open up just a separate document here that has all of that story that we've been working on with uh, the spirit monger. So the new spirit monger is... Still the same character from 10 years ago, but the Spearmonger has gained very much power. He uh, he's, he's gained a, a huge level up bonus, so to speak, because the Spearmonger now is a communal pool that all of the players will um, use the same currency from. When you defeat creatures in the tomb, they will drop spirit shards here. This so happens to be a swarm creature. It can drop multiple spirit shards. It's cool. This one is it just drops one per time you, you kill one of the swarm tokens. Uh, and what happens is, is you'll raise this up on the track. And when you want to spend some of the uh, spirit shards, 
you will um, decide as a group that you're okay with spending them. You'll lower the track and then um, you will then purchase things from the menu that the Soulmonger sells here. I'm going to go all the way to the back of the book. Unfortunately, I can't flip the book. Uh, you have to scroll through the whole book here on uh, Tabletop Simulator. But uh, you'll see here the Soulmonger has items and uh, menu services that you can purchase here. Those services and prices will all be updated. Um, you know, so uh, there's there's no inflation in the tomb. The prices are actually going to be reduced slightly to uh, to help the players a little bit because now we wanted to make it a little bit more cooperative. This particular mechanic, so we've added in that uh, that idea that this is a communal pool that you can all spend from. Also, in every scenario, the spirits that are summoned by the spirit monger will also now have their own unique special abilities, which is really neat. So I'll go over those as well um, when they come up in the game. I don't like to overwhelm people with too many rules, but that's the one biggest thing that is unique and new in this new version of the game. So again, we'll go over it when it comes up in just a little bit. Um, for now, though, uh, we will jump right into the game. The first thing that we do in Secrets of the Lost Tomb, is we will set up the main part of the game. We'll both pick characters. We will get our starting items. We'll take our character sheet. We'll slide it into our clamshell. Now, of course, the clamshells don't open and close uh, in Tabletop Simulator, but uh, they're all preset and easy for us to use in here. Um, with a two-player game, we each get six action tokens. Those are the little bullets. And when we use an action, we'll flip the tokens over. And because it's a two-player game, we're both going to get two companions as well to help us survive here in the tomb. It gives us unique special abilities, and it gives us extra health so that we can survive against monsters. So, And again, I'll go over each mechanic as we uh, go through them in the game. So after we set up our characters, we basically set up whatever it says to do in the tomb. This one is asking us to set aside a couple of items and a couple of monsters and to set up the tomb in the normal standard way. So we have level one, level two, and level three. Level three is inaccessible. We can't get to level three yet. Level two is open and adjacent to the level one tile here. So you can go down the stairs to level two anytime that you want. But you cannot get to level three yet until we find a way down. We may or may not find a way down uh, during the scenario. Uh, but the more you explore, the, the more uh, epicness that you'll find. So we're going to dive right into the scenario here. I'm going to uh, go ahead and try to... Um, I'm not going to read that right now. I want to jump in and read the story here. So, the Pharaoh with the blue eyes. The eternal order of Perseus has just received word that an ancient prophecy is about to come to pass. An EOP team recently explored and photographed a burial chamber in southern Egypt, finding a collection of glyphs which tell the story of the great Pharaoh Ra's Azulahamet. Ruling over Egypt and the entire Mediterranean for over 333 years, Raza Zulahamet enacted his warped desires, building his empire on the backs of slaves. Sickened by his deranged ways, the great pharaoh's own advisors used the power of the gods to finally put him to rest. Because of Raza's unearthly powers, he could not be killed, so the advisors knew they had to bind him forever with the three potent talismans. And so they did, or so they believed. The spell Raza Zulahamet has been held under for thousands of years is now about to wear off. The glyphs tell of where and when he will be resurrected. The place is in the tomb on Island X, and the time is only two days from now. Your team will travel by seaplane southeast towards the Caribbean and to the tomb. Your first known objective is to find the Staff of Ra, one of the potent talismans. Without these talismans, it will be near impossible to prevent Raza Zulahamet from escaping the tomb and imposing his power and influence over the world. And great power he has. All right. So now that we read this mission briefing section here, we will scroll down here to the strategy section. So as you can see in this in the original book, there's like little notes here in the margins. Uh, they're there to help you kind of learn the scenario with a little bit of tutorial. Those kind of things will stay in the first couple scenarios just to give you a little bit of help um, and just reminders as you're playing the first couple scenarios. The rules in this game are not super complex. They're meant to be pretty simple overall, but there's lots of different things that you can do in the game for immersion. So 
the strategy sections are here to kind of give you an idea and remind you of what you're trying to do in the scenario to help you when you jump in. You know you're exploring, but why are you exploring? What are you looking to, to try to get? So here's the strategy section here. We must defeat Raz Azul Ahmed. That's how you win the game. When he awakens, the potent talismans will help us combat him. These artifacts are the Staff of Ra, the Ruby Scarab, and the Cowl of Anubis. They are more easily found deeper in the tomb, but beware, some rooms will contain elite creatures. We have six rounds to find these artifacts, bolster our defenses, and prepare for the coming of Raz Azul. We must be vigilant. When Raz Azul Ahmed wakens, he will try to escape the tomb and take over the world. Every creature in the tomb will be an obstacle, blocking us from Raz as he escapes. He will stop to kill one of us, but then he will move as quickly as possible along the shortest route out of the tomb. The moment Raz leaves, we will have failed. All right, so that's what we have to do to try to win. We need to find these artifacts to help us fight him and uh, do it before he escapes the tomb. Okay, so I'll set aside the scenario book for now, and uh, we'll get back to that in just a little bit. So we're going to make James T. Temple, played by Cooper here, the first player. So he's going to be able to take the first action. So first, he'll flip over one of his little bullet tokens here, showing he's taking an action. And then he will be able to move. Now, here are all the player attributes right here. You have strength, dexterity, knowledge, mythos, and movement. So you can move as many tiles as you have movement points. So James T. Temple starts with three movement in the game, and you can gain extra stats as you play. You will probably gain some. He can move up to three, and, and in order to explore a new tile, you have to move out of one of the doors. When you do that, you're going to spawn a new tile, and that will trigger that exploration. Anytime you spawn a new tile, that stops your movement completely um, and ends your movement, but it will trigger everything that happens in the tile. So this is a level one room. That means it goes on here on level one. Level one rooms will only go on level one, but sometimes rooms will say one, two, three, or one, three, or two, three, or just two. And you'll see that they go on those specific levels and they're thematically oriented to those levels or any level possibly in the tomb. And each level has a little bit of a different theme. And as you go deeper in the tomb, it gets a little more challenging. All right, so let's see what we got here. We got the Jade Temple. So uh, first of all, we're going to spin it around and figure out how we want to orient it. We could orient it so that any door touches the, the, the door here. So as long as we can walk through a door, we can do it that way. And it's up to us how we want to try to set up the tomb. Um, this, is, this is all up to the player's choice. So we'll set it up just like that. That means later we can explore left or right from there. James goes into the room. Now the Jade Temple room here is an adventure room because it has this fedora icon here. If you so. just when you go into stuff like that, you just hit Alt and it'll blow it up on screen. So oh you're yeah, not, yeah like, that's a good idea. Around and stuff. There we go. Hold Alt and boom, we can blow it up and I don't have to spin people around and make them dizzy. That's yeah. just the tomb doing it. It's not me. Uh, so <laughs> we have to fight against that power. So yeah, here's the Jade Temple here. As I said, it's an adventure room. So we're gonna draw a story card and we're going to get an adventure. So this is a misadventure on one side. You flip it, and it is an adventure on the other side. So, here and in this adventure, I'm going to read it to the other player, and when it's my turn, the other player will read the cards and, and story stuff from the scenario to me, in case it's I'm the one who's actually uh, spawning it. This way, it's a surprise, and you don't spoil the pass or fail effects uh, when that's happening. So, it seems this bizarre device is called a soul crank. Judging by the strange letters etched on its side, tubes and wires connect and intersect in strange ways all around, and you find weird glass bottles containing glowing blue liquid. You investigate closer. This is a knowledge two check, obviously, because there's two books. That means you need two successes. So James is going to have to roll knowledge. James has a two. So he's going to roll two dice. He doesn't have any other things that give him knowledge bonuses right now. So he's going to roll two dice, and he's going to be looking for fives and sixes. A five or a six on the dice is, a, is equal to one success. So James got one six as he got one six. So unfortunately, in this instance, he would fail. Now, if he wants to, he can use an audacity point. That, that's these green here. And he's got five points on this green track. If he wants to, he can use an audacity point to re-roll the entire roll. I do not want to do that at this time. All right. So you would end up failing the roll. Womp, womp. 
Now let's see what the fail effect is. And sometimes the fail effects are really fun. And because it's an adventure, it's usually nothing too bad that happens. But uh, this one um, doesn't look so great. So <laughs> it doesn't say soul crank. It says bone crank. You accidentally turn it on and an icy gas begins to fill the room. The icy manipulation of the machine chills you to the bone. You feel very sick and lethargic. You get the minus two health and you get the status effect slowed. That's very nasty, actually. For one, two, minus two health. So we're going to get the slowed status effect. Uh, the status effect deck does not really get um, shuffled much. It is more of a status effect token deck. You'll kind of search through it. You'll find the status effect that you need, and um, then you'll just pick it up and go. This one gives you minus two movement and minus two dexterity while you have it, which is really nasty. Now, you always get a minimum of at least one in a stat so you'll have at least a minimum of one movement while he has this, but uh, hopefully we'll find a way to get rid of it. you would also use the rest action on a future turn to roll a die, and on a five or six, he'll be able to discard it. So, All right. <clears throat> so, that was pretty cool, uh, but bad. <laughs> Normally, <laughs> adventures turn, turn out to be good stuff, but uh, that was not a good stuff. So, now Bianca will go. I will flip over a token. Now, just to go over what I have again a little bit, I have a bullwhip, I have a uh, 45 caliber pistol, and I have two companions with me. I have Roger D. Martin and Earl Hawk with me. Roger D. Martin does give me some extra stats, which is really cool. So I get plus one movement from Roger and plus two strength, which is pretty cool. He's here to help. He also gives pluses to combat as well. So uh, because I have plus one movement, I actually have six movement, which is really fast. Now, Bianca Sinclair is a cat burglar, so she's really good at uh, moving, running around the tomb, and exploring. Um, so, uh, I'm actually going to take, um, Bianca a little bit closer toward the second level. I'm not going to quite jump down there just yet. So I'm going to just go down over here and I'm going to explore to the North. So let's see what we get. We found the shrine of fertility. So the shrine of fertility is a misadventure room here. So, um, I'm going to go ahead and get a misadventure and I will let Cooper read it to me. So it's a secret. You ready? Yes, indeed. This room is overgrown with spines and thorny plants. You carefully navigate through, only snagging your clothes on a few small spikes. You're almost safe when the plants come to life and attack. Whoa. <laughs> All right, so it's a one mythos check here. Yeah, it's so a chest mythos for this. Unfortunately, I only have a one mythos. We are... Uh, Finding some good tough ones here to show. So I have a one mythos. That means I only get to roll one die. Um, I really don't want to fail this. So I am going to uh, go ahead and spend an audacity before the roll to give myself a potential success on a four, five, or six. So instead of doing um, a five or six, I'm going to get a little bit of an extra bonus chance to try to succeed. Um as Pentrals, I see your comment. We are making the tiles interlock. They will be puzzle pieces. We just couldn't do it here in Tabletop Simulator um, or in our regular prototypes. But if you look at the video on the GameFound campaign, you'll see that they, they show that there's a video of the interlocking tiles there. So um, we just want you to know they will all be interlocking in the final version, which I think is super helpful because when you want to move the full tomb and you, and you start building out, it's easy to slide the whole tomb down by having them interlock. So they will be interlocking, so no worries. Um, we just couldn't really do it easily here in Tabletop Simulator. These are also a little extra large. They would be kind of trimmed down, and then you'd see they'd have little puzzle pieces in them which would allow them to lock, so... They will be locking, so no worries. All right, so I'm going to roll my Mythos check on a 4, 5, or 6. Let's see if I can get something. I got a 3, of course, so I have failed. <laughs> I'm not going to re-roll that. We're just going to okay. take the bad stuff. The vines first wrap around your legs, forcing you to the ground. Helpless, their drill tendrils begin to burrow into your skin. You wrench your arms and legs away, tearing muscle and flesh in your escape. <laughs> Minus 3 health. <sighs> And <laughs> minus two um, courage, courage, and, and then the also status. you get the poison status. So so nasty. I probably should have rerolled. So three health, two courage, right there, and the poison status effect. Um, let me grab this horrific status. That is really nasty. 
You can't get yeah. it. It's not moving. There it goes. All right. So I got the poison status effect, which is really crappy. <laughs> on upkeep, I lose two health. And when I rest, I can try to uh, get rid of the poison. On a one, I'll discard. So hopefully I can get rid of it or find another way to get rid of it in the game. We'll see. But now I'm poisoned. That is pretty <laughs> nasty. That's nasty. Um, so really quick, obviously when you lose health, uh, you know, um, one, two, three. There. Not, not down to two. I'm down to nine. Uh, when you lose health, obviously when you go down below one, your character would die. And you would, uh, if the bo boss has not yet spawned, you'll actually respawn as a new hero at the beginning of the tomb. And you would go ahead and join the game again. Um, the tomb track would raise by one. And you would just keep playing. Once the boss spawns, though, if you would be killed, you would be out of the game. You'd be dead and gone, unfortunately. So... Yeah, thanks, Gannon. Yeah, I almost just completely took like uh, 10 health instead of three. So <laughs> <laughs> it happens. And then with the courage track here, this is kind of a horseshoe looking track. Um, my character, Bianca, started on plus one. Uh, when the track, when you would go up here on the track, you actually gain bonuses. They are um, temporary bonuses that you gain while your courage is in these thresholds. And they are cumulative. So as you go up, here, for instance, once I get above plus three, I'm plus four, five, or six, I get plus one to combat and plus one to adventure checks, which, um, you know, wouldn't have helped me on the last one. But once you get plus seven, eight, or nine, I'd actually get plus three to misadventure checks, which would have been awesome. Uh, unfortunately, of course, we just started the game. I didn't get any bonuses yet, so uh, I didn't have that yet. And if you ever get to plus 10, you get a permanent special bonus. This one is the Wings of Mercury status effect, which is a really powerful awesome status effect that lets you move really fast and do some cool stuff. Now, when you go lower here, uh, you get the negative aspect of it. So for this one, I'd lose a combat. I'd lose an adventure, uh, a roll of a die to adventure checks. And then when I go even lower, it's minus three to misadventure checks. And eventually you get to negative 10 and you would flee the tomb. Uh, now when you flee the tomb, it's uh, literally your character is, physically has gone kind of crazy they are completely scared um they can't take it anymore and they try to run out of the tomb the tomb is a very scary creepy weird place so basically they would spend every action they can to try to run out the front door of the tomb so on my character's turn for instance if i was at the negative 10 and i were to flee the tomb because my speed is so fast i would uh, on one move get out the door now if a player is ever in the way of you as you attempt to flee the tomb, you stop and they will make a special check to try to calm you down. It's a calm down check. And if they can calm you down, they prevent you from fleeing the tomb. If they fail, uh, you technically will keep running and you will try to escape the tomb. If you do, just like getting killed in the tomb, you will respawn at the front of the tomb with a new character and continue playing uh, unless the final boss has spawned. If the final boss has already spawned, it, you're out. Uh, you flee the tomb. You, it's just like if, as if you died, you'd be out of the game at that point. Um, we don't like player elimination in games at Everything Epic, but um, in this particular instance, uh, if you get uh, defeated by the boss in essence or the boss has already spawned, it's one way you lose the game uh, by dying or fleeing the tomb. So uh, at that point, there wouldn't be too much game left to uh, to be out for, so to speak. So that's that's how those mechanics work. Again, it's one of the ways you can lose the game in this cooperative game. All right, so with all of that explanation said here and all of these uh, wonderful status effects that we have found, uh, we will go ahead and continue exploring. So James only has one movement, but luckily he has places to go. So he can go through the Jade Temple room there to, uh, to the next room over. And wonderfully, he found the ceiling spike trap. Awesome. So uh, like Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, uh, James needed to try to find the the latch that's hidden somewhere. So he has to use his knowledge to hopefully find the latch or the lever to turn off the ceiling spike trap. He's got two knowledge, and we're going to hope for the best uh, that he can get that one success that he needs to prevent uh, the ceiling spike trap here. He didn't get it. Um, I am going to spend an audacity. Good idea. On this you do have a lot of audacity, so that's pretty helpful. So you spend an audacity, and when you spend audacity, you have to re-roll the entire roll. 
or you can spend it before the roll in order to succeed on four, fives, or sixes, or you could do both if you want. And that roll was not any better. I'm Dang. gonna do it again. You're gonna spend another one? All right. Yeah, I don't Let's wanna take goes. this five damage. All right, that's much there better. Go. You got two successes. You passed. Now, uh, so you wouldn't take the five damage, which is really nasty. Now, um. The ceiling spike trap, unlike other tra other traps, it only has one trigger. Once the ceiling, ceiling spikes come down, they're locked into place and they're down. Um, but other trap rooms can, can potentially have multiple uh, triggers on them. And if they do, you would take a uh, trap token, you'd put it on the room. And for every time a player would walk through that room later, it would trigger the trap. You would know that it would happen and you'd have a chance to either avoid it or trigger it, or like Bianca here, she has a special ability called Trap Master. She gets bonuses to trap checks. Of course, she didn't go through the trap. Uh, James did. And uh, on action, she can actually use Dexterity to disarm traps and remove trap tokens, which is cool. So that's just something that uh, she can do, um, which is neat, because every character is completely unique. So, well, that was uh, another awesome find there, James. So uh, Bianca will continue to explore, even though she's poisoned. Maybe we'll find something to cure it with, uh, or maybe we'll find one of the potent talismans, which will be nice too. So uh, I will continue exploring north here and see what we find. Actually, no. I'm scared that now I know James has uh, been slowed. I'm actually going to try to explore closer to James. I'm going to, since I have so much movement, I'm going to explore a little closer and then if I need to help James or, or vice versa, um, he'll be able to possibly, hopefully, move a little closer. So, uh, again, I have I have crazy movements where I have six movement right now. So I'll go one, two, three, and I'll explore um, this way a little further. Let's see what we find. Oh, uh, Leif Erikson's Grotto. Leif Erikson's Grotto uh, has two effects on it. Uh, the exploration effect here is what you always trigger first, if it has one. So the exploration effect here is plus one movement. As if I didn't have enough movement, I'm super <laughs> speed now. I am the flash. So we will take this cube and we will place it on our movement track here. This just goes to show we have plus one permanent movement. So our movement is now six plus Roger DeMartin's bonus, helping us move faster with inspirational speeches, plus one more movement. So I actually can move up to seven, which is really, really fast now. Uh, also, we have a scenario trigger one effect. That means we will go into the scenario book. We will look at the scenario triggered effects section here. Now, again, these are the old icons. So this is a new icon. These are the old icons, uh, but they mean the same thing. So... Scenario triggered effect one, unleash the curse of the mummy, 1.1. So 1.1, the curse of the mummy. All around the room, there are engravings, hieroglyphics, and ancient relics from the age of Egyptian empires. They mention Razazul Ahmet many times. As you search these histories for clues, you wake something from its deep slumber. Its disembodied blue eyes flash in the darkness, and a loud, maniacal laughter echoes in the depths of your mind, mesmerizing you for a moment. You try to resist... You attempt to resist the curse. Roll mythos. Wonderfully, of course, as you know, my character does not really like the occult much, so they don't know much about mythos. So I've got one die, uh, and I'm going to hope to pass because the curse of the tomb is not great. So let's see what we do with our mythos. Roll it. Uh, of course, it's a one. Nice. <laughs> Uh, I will uh, re-roll that to try to not get a one. Can I get a not one? Oh, I got a five. Uh, that means I pass. So that's one success all I needed. So yes. it was worth spending the audacity. Definitely. So I resist the curse. And of course, if I failed, that would have been marked by the ancient Egyptian curse of Razazul. And that would get curse of the tomb. And that is really nasty, especially being poisoned as well. So that's not good. Now back to Jimmy. Let's see All what right, Jimmy's I got. Still only got one movement, so I am going to move one here. And try to explore. All right. So let's see what we get here. Uh, this is a level two three room. So we'll actually discard that, and instead we will spawn this room here. Uh, this is Mount Olympus. Woo! So Mount Olympus is a really cool and unique room. Uh, it is a scenario trigger to one room like we just saw. Also, 
it is a Zeus's Bolt search room. Uh, that means on a future turn, you can do an artifact search by rolling your current audacity in dice to try to find Zeus's Lightning Bolt. Uh, and if you do that, you'll get a really cool artifact. If you fail, you'll lose audacity and you can't try again. Now, like we just read for me, he just found another scenario trigger one effect. So he will also try to be cursed. I'm not going to read the story again this time, but we do know that he has to roll Mythos to try to resist Mythos this curse. Two. So let's see what happens. I'll flip over my action token that I forgot to flip over. Thanks, Russ. I did it already for you. Oh, you did? Okay, okay. sorry. Ah, so you failed? Yes. Wonderful. Well, I now everybody gonna, gets to see what the curse the, of the curse of the money is. I'm going to spend an audacity. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, you, you want to? You want to spend an audacity? No, no, okay. right. It's really nasty. The curse I know. Of the tomb. I'll, we'll, see, we'll get to everybody see what it is. All right. The curse of the tomb. Might as well be slowed and cursed and all the stuff. So you get minus one to all checks. When you draw a story card, it's always a misadventure. And uh, when you gain this, you lose all current audacity points. And uh, you want to roll die on a six discard So uh, when you rest. So surprise, unfortunately, um, you've lost all of your audacity. So we'll just throw your token uh, in the garbage. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, you've, uh, you've lost all your audacity, and it's really nasty. Now, technically, you could look at it beforehand. You could try to re-roll them, but it happens. Right. You got the Curse of the Tomb. And uh, there are some ways to get rid of these other than resting. Um, one of the ways um, that it doesn't that we don't have the actual paper reference in here for the spirit monger yet. However, you can spend five spirit shards in order to cure any status effect. Right How now do you we get have spirit zero. shards, Chris? We get spirit shards by fighting and defeating creatures. So in the game here, you'll see that creatures have a spirit shard amount, and when you defeat them, you'll get that on the track as a communal pool item. So we need to get some creatures, hopefully, to uh, start defeating so that we can go ahead and uh, get some spirits here. So uh, we need to keep exploring. I want to make sure I try to find um, find one of these potent talismans soon. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm actually going to, because I'm super fast still, I'm going to go downstairs now. I'm going to leave James because he's cursed. He's got broken feet. Uh we're just going to... Um, what a teammate. We're going to have to move on and try to save the world here. <laughs> what and, a teammate. Uh, yeah, it happens. So I'm going to explore over here. I'm going to take uh, I'm gonna take this tile here. I wanted to show this tile to you before. Normally you don't take it from the discard pile, but I'm going to take it there. Because I really want to show you uh, the Sword in the Stone room. Uh, because I really like the Sword in the Stone room. So that's uh, just a little, a little cheat on my end. So the Sword in the Stone room here, of course, has Excalibur in the stone. So it has the Excalibur search, and it is a scenario trigger two effect. So again, on a future turn, you can search for Excalibur, try to pull the sword from the stone, which is really cool. Uh, but that's on a future turn with a future action. But for now, we're going to trigger the scenario trigger two effect. So uh, in order to do that, we're going to look here. It says scenario trigger two, scenario trigger three. The first time you find one, you find the Staff of Ra. Read 2.1. So... 2.1 is the first potent talisman, the Staff of Ra. In the center of this room is a strange platform, and on it sit three huge sarcophagi shaped in the likeness of the great sun king Ra. On the centermost sarcophagus, Ra's hands are crossed over his chest, holding the legendary Staff of Ra. This is what you've been searching for. What luck. Pulling with all of your might, you yank the staff from the once pristine coffin. And as soon as you remove it, the lids of the coffins float up into the air, releasing plumes of horrid fumes and then smash to the floor. Out of the coffins emerge three huge reanimated mummies. This can't be happening. The legends are true. So we will spawn three huge reanimated mummies here. So we will get the... Keepers of the Tomb, again, normally I would set these aside at the beginning of the game, but because we're here in Tabletop Simulator, it's usually easy to just search the deck like that. So we are spawning three mummies in the room here. Once we defeat them, we will get the Staff of Ra. I'm also going to take out the three potent talismans, the Staff of Ra, the Cowl of Anubis, and the Ruby Scarab, which are, again, supposed to have been set aside at the beginning, but I was trying to hurry up. 
to get people started here. So those are the three potent talismans. This is the Staff of Ra. It is a, a two-handed mythos weapon, and on use, you will get plus 10 to undead. Uh, uh, combat against undead and horror creatures really great. And uh, plus 5 in general with mythos combat. And of course, the boss here, guess what uh, type of creature Razazula Hamet is? He is an undead creature. So finding these artifacts is really beneficial and really helps you win the game. Do you need, do you have to find them to possibly win? No. Uh, Razazu will spawn um, on the, the uh, sixth comet track, whether you find them or not. And you can technically still try to fight him. You'll probably die, but there's a chance still that you can possibly get him. So that's all uh, up to uh, how powerful you are at that time. So now that I've explored this room, my action is over. I can't continue doing anything. Can't attack them yet. But um, it will go back to James. And when it comes back to me, I'm going to try to fight them. James is going to, uh, I don't know. Um, you're probably going to have to rest. <laughs> yeah, it's probably a good idea. So when you rest, okay. you take the rest action. You spend one action token. And then you do all of the rest items. So on rest, you can gain two courage or two health or one in one. And then you get whatever other potential rest actions that are uh, that are. Um, options here for your for your status effects so you're going to try to get rid of slowed and curse of the tomb uh which one do you want to try for first well i'll we'll do curse first all right curse you need a six on this check you failed unfortunately and you cannot re-roll it cursed. you're still cursed now let's try to get rid of slowed which would be really good five or six and uh you keep slowed as well unfortunately so, uh, so yeah, that's a bummer. But at least you got some uh, courage or health or a combination of both. What did you take? I just took two uh, courage. Okay. So you uh, hype yourself up after not being able to walk and being cursed. Yeah, I get I get angry because my my anger fuels into bravery and courage. It's whatever it takes to uh, try to save the world here. Um, sometimes bad things happen, but we're going to endure. We're going to do our best. Um, uh, okay, so as you well, at least you rested Mount Olympus. That was pretty cool, hanging out with uh, the spirit of Zeus over there. So, uh, looks like I've got three actions left here. So I'm going to go ahead and fight one of these mummies. I'm going to drag one over here so I can show you what we're doing all in one place, a little bit easier. So. Here we have the Keeper of the Tomb. Uh, in order to do combat, um, we will first take a Courage attack, and then we will make our dice pool with our weapons, and we will fight against the creature um, and the, against the creature's combat score. The most important thing about combat that I always tell people to remember is, it's, it's very simple to remember, um, when you attack the creature or you do combat with the creature, it's always the exact same thing as when the creature does combat with you during the tomb phase. So the creature never rolls dice, um, creatures and, 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 and enemies, they never um, specifically do anything um, on their turn that will be their own rolls or, or things that you have to roll against yourself. Um, I don't like rolling dice against myself. I like rolling dice against monsters. So when we do combat with the creature or the creature does combat with us, it's always the same roll. So we will make our dice pool the same way during the tomb phase and on this phase. We roll it and then we test it against the creature's score. All right. How do we do that? Well, Bianca Sinclair here has uh, a pistol and a bullwhip. Um, they are both dexterity weapons and they are one-handed dexterity weapons. That means she could dual wield. Um, because we think that's cool. So we uh, allow her to dual wield. So she will get to get the bonus from the pistol and the bullwhip plus, whoops, plus her dexterity. So she's going to get four dice for dexterity. She's going to get plus one for the bullwhip and plus three for the pistol. Okay. Then we're going to check her, her, um, her companions here. She's got plus one against undead from having Roger D. Martin, which is pretty cool. So she's going to get eight dice for her weapons and her decks and an additional plus one die for having Roger. Now, Earl Hawk here also has a huge cool bonus per round. When you do combat, you can tap him or turn him to get plus four 
combat and succeed on a four, five, or six. I'm going to save that for my next combat so that I can go ahead and um, blast that out. So, um, again, the first thing I do when I fight a creature is I'm going to take a courage attack. So he's got a two courage attack, so I'm going to lose two courage, one, two. When I defeat the creature, I'm going to get to regain some courage, which is pretty cool. So that's what we're going to move on to. Uh, Davi Gozavir. Um, you are correct. You can actually gain courage using the rest action above your starting courage. I wasn't sure. I didn't notice here. He actually did do that. So we, we really have to regain health here in this instance. <clears throat> That's a good call. Nice one. Yes. You can't rest to regain higher than your starting stats. Uh, but you can gain courage higher, of course, in in-game effects and using special items and things like that as well. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. You're correct. So, uh, again, we've got eight dice for our character. We got plus one for our companion. So we're going to roll nine dice. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And we are rolling against his three combat scores. So let's roll it and see what we do here. So we've got one, two, three, four, five successes. One, two, three, four, five. We're just looking again for fives and sixes. So we got five successes. Now we're going to match our five successes versus his combat score here. So the difference between the creature's combat score and your successes is how much damage you take. So because I've rolled equal to or greater than his combat score, I take no damage and he takes damage equal to all of my successes. Okay, so he's going to take five. I'm actually one shotting. He's going to die again because he's undead. And I'm going to take nothing. Now, let's say, because he's got a three combat score, let's say I rolled only two successes instead. In that instance, I would take one and he would take two. Okay? So that's, again, the difference between his combat score and my successes. But again, I, I rolled five. So he takes five. He is one-shotted, which is great for us. Now, we're going to regain courage. So you always gain, regain courage equal to half the creature's courage rounded up. So I'm going to regain one, and because I defeated him, we have a little new rule. If you're the one who actually defeats the creature, you get an additional plus one, okay? And other people in the room, if, if James was in the room, he would also gain courage as well. But because James is across the uh, tomb in Mount Olympus hanging out, unfortunately he didn't notice me kill the creature, didn't get inspired by it, so he doesn't gain any more courage from that. Now that will go over your starting courage um, instead, for instance. So... Uh, we also will gain three soul shards here because we defeat this creature. And I'm going to take this creature and throw him off the board. And then we will get three souls there. A little bit, we're a little bit closer to be able to uh, heal some status effects, which is really nice. And that's the end of my turn. So that's how combat works in one quick combat. So now we'll go to uh, James and see what uh, James wants to do. That's right, I'm Russ. Gonna... There was no armor on that uh, on that creature, so there it, all the all the damage goes directly to the creature. Uh, if a creature has armor, um, it will basically absorb damage before it hits the creature. Uh, and sixes are critical hits on rolls, so they always hit the creature. What is this? I am going to uh, rest again because I do want to see if I could get rid of any of these status effects. All right. So we'll do uh, left to right. I did not roll that, so I'm going to re-roll that. Actually, there we go. There we go. Uh, it's a four. fail, but still. It's okay. I rolled it right. All right, then we'll move to the right, and we'll do the slowed. Five or six. Yeah. All right, that's go. good. You really wanted to get rid of that slowed. That slowed's really not cool. So now you regain your movement. So that was totally worth it, I think. Cool. And I gained two health. Awesome. Uh, oh, yeah, so you wouldn't be able to regain it above your uh, your starting health, starting unfortunately. Health, same, oh, same for both? Yeah. Okay. That's right. So well, at least you're at your starting stuff, and you're not that hurt, and you got rid of the slow, so you'll be able to move properly next turn, which is really good. All right, so I'm going to attack the next creature. <laughs> you threw the slowed right at the mummy. It's funny. All right, I'm going to attack the next <laughs> creature here. Let's see what we do. That's right, Russ. The uh, the courage um, attack really only happens once per character 
per creature. So the first one you attack, you will lose courage. Um, but the next, uh, if you attack that one again, you don't lose courage twice in a row. You only lose it the first time for each individual creature card itself. And then you regain it, of course, for each one you defeat. So that's really good. All right, so I'm going to attack the next one here. Um, exactly the same type of creature. So again, I will lose to courage. I am going to also, again, get uh, eight, nine dice to attack. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Do you want to use your companion or no? I think I'm going to save. Well, I save got what? Okay. One more action. I'll save. Uh, I'll save Earl for the last action. If I get really lucky again somehow, maybe I can kill all three in the first round, which would be uh, pretty awesome. But uh, yeah, you know, we'll see how it goes. Uh, actually, you know what I'll do? I'll use an audacity here to make it so that I succeed on a four, five, or six. And then if I need to on the next round, I'll use Earl for the next attack. We'll try that out. So let's roll it. Wow, the four, five, or six was a really good choice because I got a lot of fours here. I got one, two, three, four, five, fours, and one, five. So I actually ended up with um, six successes. And if I didn't use Audacity, I would have had only one success here. So it was one, two, three, four, five. Uh, six successes, which is really, really good. This is a cock die here, it looks like. Um, I would have might I potentially could have even had one more success, but we're gonna don't we don't have to worry about it because um, we uh, well over killed this creature again, which is great for us. That's really lucky. So this creature is dead. We gain three more soul shards here, spirit shards there, and I will regain some courage as well. And, uh, yeah, that was awesome. Now back to James. All right, I am actually going to... Uh... So we actually have five soul shards here. If you want to get rid of the curse, we can spend five of our six soul shards, and you can just have the soul monger cure your curse for you, which I'm okay with um, if you want to do that. I think it's worthwhile. Yeah, I definitely think that's worth it. And that's it. a free action. Curse of the tomb. Yeah, free action anywhere in the tomb. So we call upon the power of the soul monger. He shows up and he's like, I'll, I'll cure you of this curse. And uh, he basically eats the souls of the uh, defeated creatures to empower himself to help us. So uh, that's what happens. And now James is free and clear. So now All you right, can so still take I your will... turn as normal. Yep. And uh, my movement is... To, I want to make sure I don't have any other negative modifiers on me. I had so many. <laughs> so uh, it's three. three. Uh, I am going to move one, two, and three. Uh-oh. Let's see what we get. Uh-oh, that's not good. Oh, it's the dart trap room. Oh, nice. I'm just going to eat all these traps. It's <laughs> <laughs> great. So this is a dexterity <laughs> check. Uh, and this one has three triggers on it. So after he triggers it the first time, it's going to have two left, so I'm going to put two tokens on it. Here. Right. My dex is three. I don't have any bonuses. Yeah, that's true. Let's see what happens. You, Ah, you failed. <laughs> <laughs> for some reason, I thought you passed for a second, but... Uh, Russ, no. you got to do me a favor and, like, touch my dice or something. It's like... <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we need the power of... Uh, Russ is, uh, Russ is like, I'll never here. let you guys roll dice for me. Yeah, this is, uh, this is nasty. So, uh, wonderful. You got rid of all your status effects, and now you lose two health and gain a new status effect. Poisoned. Um, might as well. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think I have more than one of each card here in the prototype, so I'm going to just give you my poison. We'll share poison. Nice. So, um, here we, uh, we both have poison. And again, on upkeep, we'd lose two health. And uh, when we rest, we would roll a die and try to discard it. Um, I've just been ignoring my poison just to uh, to keep going. Um, I don't mind if I have to take some little health damage at the end of the round. I will do it. So, well, you you, you got another trap. That was good stuff. Good job. And I'm gonna attack this creature. It's funny because we're getting all beat up. We have all these things, but we're actually doing okay still. Um, uh, so far, we almost have the first potent talisman, and it's only round one. So we're getting a little beat up, but. Uh, we're not doing so bad, actually. Although I did use all my audacity, too. But anyway, um, <laughs> I really want to try to, to defeat these creatures. I'm going to use Earl Hawk's power. This is a once-per-round ability. This is my companion here. Uh, 
we will just turn him to show that we've used him once per round. When we do, we're going to get plus four combat, so I'm going to get 13 dice, lucky number 13, and we're going to also succeed on a four, five, or six. So I had nine, 10, 11, 12. I'm going to have 12 dice, 12 dice. All right, so no, no, I get four, plus four for Earl Hawk, sorry. Four? Yeah, four. Yeah, 13. Uh, I think because I right. this is a, a locked uh, thing that you, we can't uh, replicate the components, just so you guys know. Oh. Uh, um. Hmm. Can I clone? Does that work? Oh, uh, uh. Nice job. Yeah. There you go. Let's clone some poison. Yeah, you're right. You, we got. Oh, it's disabled Thank you. for me. Thank you. Thank you. I'm le Yeah, I guess I have the game master uh, ability here. Yeah. No, that was great. Thank you very much. I actually didn't realize I could do that. I'm. I'm still fairly new to tabletop simulator. But yeah. So yeah. Thanks. Thanks for spreading the poison. We. We. I was trying to get, just give it to him. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, so now I have poison, too. Anyway, Earl Hawk, plus four dice. I'm uh, going to roll 13 here. Let's uh, let's see. On a four, five, or six, let's see if I can one-shot all these creatures. I've been, I've been doing really well here with uh, my rolls. Let's see how we do. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine successes on the four, fives, or six. We rolled a lot of four. This is a... Epic roll. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine successes. Oof, ooh. This guy just, just explodes in a cloud of dust and, and bandages. <laughs> and we get plus three again. Um, I didn't take the loss like I normally would. Uh, that would actually give me one minus one uh, combat. I messed up. So it should have been minus two first. And then I would have actually lost a combat. But with the nine successes, we still did it. So it's okay. And then I'd regain one here for defeating him. Um, and then we get the Staff of Ra. So the Staff of Ra, again, is super powerful. It's meant to be a Mythos weapon. It's actually showing knowledge right now, but it's supposed to be Mythos, two-handed weapon. So if you want to, you can use this as a Mythos weapon. My Mythos is kind of crappy, so it would actually be better if it was knowledge. But it's actually meant to be a Mythos weapon. You get plus five to combat with it. And then, again, you can spend a, a trigger, uh, excuse me, a... Um, uh, a, a use of it to get plus 10 additional combat against undead or horror creatures. And it has only three uses. Now I would never in this scenario want to use all three uses unless I was using the last use on Razazul and I knew I was going to defeat him with it because once you get rid of it, you would lose its additional scenario effect. So the, uh, the staff of Ra has unique, why do I keep doing that? Unique abilities against Razazul. So the Staff of Ra, Razazul's combat rating is reduced by 5. And Razazul's combat rating is extremely high here. Let's just bring it over here so we can see it at the same time. Razazul's combat rating is 18. So we want that to be reduced. It's really nasty. And then if you have the Ruby Scarab also, he can't trigger his special abilities. So we never saw special abilities yet. They were on the mummies. And it's because I rolled so amazingly that they didn't come up. However... Razazul and his mummy friends have special abilities and they trigger whenever you would roll a one in your roll and you would take damage. But because my successes were so high, I never took any damage and so my ones didn't matter. I did actually roll, I think, at least, yeah, I had at least one, I had a couple ones in my last roll, but my successes were so high I didn't take any damage, so the special ability doesn't trigger. But if you would ever even take one damage, you'd still trigger the special ability whenever you um, roll a one against a creature with a special ability. So, uh, of course, uh, Razazul has the Mummy's Curse as his special ability. And if you have the Ruby Scarab, it doesn't do anything. Uh, and then the Cal of Anubis, Razazul cannot perform his Courage Attack, and his Courage Attack is a seven. So he's extremely scary, extremely powerful. Um, we'll look at the other artifacts with him as well for fun. So we'll take these over here real quick. The Cal of Anubis here gives you plus one armor. So that means you just reduce armor. And then when you take damage, you reduce the damage by one to a minimum of one. So this just reduces lots of damage for you and also gives you an armor. So it reduces the damage and reduces an additional damage beyond that, no matter what. So it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty powerful. And then the Ruby Scarab on upkeep, it's the opposite of poison. It uh, heals you to... Um, every turn, which is really cool. And this one can raise your maximum health 
um, as well. So you can see the cards here. Um, I'll, I'll alt them for you as well to make them a little bit uh, a little bit straighter to read. But um, this one also gives you a plus two mythos permanently. So the person who's using the Staff of Ra, and if they have the Ruby Scarab as well, they'll have an even better combat score with it as well. And there's the Cowl of Anubis. Take also, you when you, while you're holding Alt, if you web wheel, it'll make it bigger and it'll stay that size. Ooh. Oh. Yeah, now, now when you Alt, that. it'll blow up that big every Huge time. Huge cards. I'm learning. I'm learning. The next stream will be even better, I promise. Let's look at my leather jacket. Okay, cool. That's great. Yeah, I didn't. Even, I had no idea. <laughs> it's really good. And here's the staff of Ra. So you can see them really big on the screen. It's a lot easier to read now. Probably even easier to read than when you have physical components. But uh, the person running the uh, the actual game here has to know how to use all of the cool tabletop simulator stuff. So that's really cool. Thanks for the uh, suggestion. It's a good one. All right. So we have defeated the. Three Keepers of the Tomb. We've gained the first Potent Talisman, and that was one round, basically, of the game here. Um, and so we, I think we did pretty well, although we did get a little bit beat up, but uh, we made it through the first round really well. So at the end of the round, when all players have spent all of their actions, we then draw a Tomb card, okay? The, the Tomb cards... There we go. <laughs> Uh, have a unique special ability, a tomb effect. Some of them are good, some of them are bad, some of them are somewhere in between. This particular one is a good effect. The first player may draw an item from the discard pile. Uh, there are no items currently in the discard pile, so unfortunately you don't get anything, but uh, that's the effect. Um, the second thing you do, and you just follow them in order. So the second thing you do would be to move creatures. There are no creatures still left alive in the tomb. So we don't move any creatures. Then we would spawn new creatures. So this one says you get plus one base creature on level one and no creatures on level two and then a creature on level three. But because we didn't explore level three, we wouldn't spawn anything on level three. And creatures spawn on misadventure and trap rooms and possibly some other rooms. And the way you normally would know that is because those rooms would have red outlines around them. Again, the prototype doesn't have them but we would spawn them in misadventure or trap rooms. And we would choose the one that we want to spawn them in if there are multiple options. Because James is in this trap, we're not going to spawn a creature on him. We have the choice as players to choose where to put it. We have a misadventure up here, so we could put it here, or we could put it here if we wanted to. I think it's probably better to put it away, as far away from James as possible, as to uh, not mess him up. Um, we're going to put the revolutionary poltergeist in here. I also drew the Carnivorous Scarabs. Uh, this is a um, swarm creature. These are actually set aside at the beginning of the scenario. I didn't, again, I, I'm naughty. I didn't do that. I was trying to hurry up and get into the scenario to not uh, waste too much time. So I didn't uh, set them aside properly. So when I drew it, I would just put it to the side for now. But uh, these are swarm creatures. These will spawn on the next scenario triggered effect. Um, and they'll be protecting, of course, the Ruby Scarab. So we would have to defeat them. Uh, a couple of these guys to get the Ruby Scarab uh, on the next scenario triggered effect. Uh, so anyway, we did our, our monster spawn here. The Revol uh, Looks like James decided to haunt himself. So uh, the Revolutionary Poltergeist is a unique creature. Um, they, instead of having a combat score, they just have a really high armor, and then they have a higher courage attack. Um, so they actually don't deal any physical damage, but they scare you. So... Um, in order to defeat them also, because they have five armor, you need to deal them one damage that either is a critical hit, which is a six to get through their armor, or you'd have to roll six successes to defeat them. But again, they don't deal any physical damage because they're ghosts. So that's how those guys work as well. And then after we spawn creatures, and again, this, I, I spawned it over here and it somehow just ghosted its way over here. But, uh, after we spawn creatures... We then do upkeep. So anything that has an upkeep, we would then deal with that. So um, uh, if you shoot a gun and it has an upkeep, normally you turn it to remind yourself to do the upkeep. Again, it's hard to do in tabletop simulator with the lock twos and stuff. I'd have to like move it and then leave it over here or something. So I didn't really do that, but I, I remember anyway. So because I shot my gun, that means I have to check and see if it's out of ammo. So you only do that at the end of the round. So you keep shooting it the whole round. You can keep using it over and over. But at the end of the round, you're going to see if you actually ran out of ammo. So now we're going to roll a die and on a one discard. So let's see. Do we discard our gun? Hopefully not. 
Nope, we're good. That's full of ammo still. Um, we would refresh our companions that were used. So we refresh our old hawk so we can use them again next round. So that's cool. Um, and uh, you, you never got effect. to shoot your gun. And even if you did, yours doesn't have upkeep. So you don't ever have to worry about it. This gun is a very powerful, really good gun. So it never has upkeep. It doesn't run out of ammo. You can lose it other ways. The game could just tell you to discard your weapon for some crazy reason. It can happen uh, randomly, magically. Uh, but that didn't happen, so you don't have to do anything for that. Um, and so we don't have any other upkeep right now to deal with. And um, Poison. The poison, uh, you don't, nothing happens with the poison until you, uh, oh, we have to take damage. Oh, boo. All right, so we take our poison damage. Burp, burp, two damage a person. Womp. Oh, well, we'll have to cure that someday. Or maybe we can uh, beat the game before we die from poison. Who knows? <laughs> um, then we have uh, what we, the old mechanic is called the search mechanic. That's removed from this section of the game. Uh, the search mechanic may, is, is right now not in the game anymore. We took it out for now. We may bring it back as a deck of cards where you just draw a, a search card when you want to search a room to see if you find extra items and stuff like that. But right now we removed it because it had a very fiddly little token from 10 years ago that we don't want in the game. So we're taking that out for now and we may re-implement it as like a little deck of cards for search cards. But for right now, you don't have to worry about it on the tomb card. It's not lo no longer on the tomb card. And the last thing you do is you raise the Comet Track. So this particular card says raise the Comet Track plus one. So we would go over here and we would raise that to plus one. I also have a cube here on six because on Comet Track six, Raz Azul Ahmet, according to the scenario, if you look in the scenario triggered effects section, it says the Great Pharaoh Awakens on Comet Track six. So the one downside to using the alt thing is I can't show people stuff with my mouse which is sometimes useful. So I'm doing that now. Comet Track 6, The Great Pharaoh Awakens, read 3.1. So eventually when we get to Comet Track 6, we would go to Section 3.1. We would follow the rules. It has a little story. It tells you where to spawn Raz Azul um, and what to do. You'd also then read, it says that after you spawn him, you'd read 3.2 and you read all of the rules for Raz. We kind of skipped ahead and looked at some of the rules on purpose so that we can have an idea what the magical items do. So I can give you a little bit of an idea for that. So... Once we do all the upkeep and we do the common track, that's the end of all of the, the tomb phase. We would then reset all of our actions and we would start the next round and we would keep playing and continue from there. So that right there is one round in the game of Secrets of the Lost Tomb. I just wanted to take a, a quick, quick hour. This has already been an hour. Time flies when you're having fun. Take a quick hour to just do a quick demo here on uh, stream to show people the game. Um, and give you a little idea of how the game plays. Um, as in this one, as you can see, random stuff happens. We had a lot of crazy uh, bad stuff happen to us, but we also had some really interesting and some good stuff happen to us. We had some great roles. We fought the monsters. Um, so this was, again, just a quick demo. We're not going to play the full game right now, but if you guys want us to play more of the game, uh, we can do that on a future day where I can set it up and we can sit here and play for a couple hours and play through the entire game uh, without as much uh, stopping for all the explanations. Um, but for right now, what I'd love to do is stay for a few more minutes and just answer questions in chat. We have about 30 people here, which is awesome. Thanks for coming. We really appreciate you coming and checking it out. And we will be posting this also as a video later. So if you want to rewatch it, look at certain parts, laugh at us as we get poisoned, um, watch us as we fail rolls, uh, watch us yeah. as we succeed and roll crazy epic rolls and, and defeat monsters, you can rewatch it. And for the people who couldn't make it today, they can rewatch it as well. So uh, if you guys have any questions, I'll, we'll, we'll stay here for a few minutes and be happy to answer questions, show you specific things. Feel free to just go ahead and uh, type it into the uh, into the chat if there's anything you want to uh, to take a look at. We'll be happy to show you a little bit of a closer look. And again, if you guys like these, feel free to comment on the Game Found campaign and let us know that you liked um, us playing the game. We can also do future streams post Game Found campaign where we're maybe playtesting game components, where we're maybe showing off unique new scenarios and stuff like that. They'll have spoilers, of course, to story stuff, but the game is unique and different every time you play. The The room tile stack is always random. The the story cards are random. The order in which you'll find the scenario triggered effects, they're going to be random because the way you explore the game. Monsters that spawn are going to be random and unique. So 
the the companions you get, the characters you choose, all of those things are random elements or or player choice elements like picking characters and stuff like that that make the game different every time you play. Um, so it's super super replayable. Um, this scenario played out because we chose to explore this way. We got these tiles um, and did this stuff. Um, and because of our roles, the way we were able to play also changed because James got slowed and he got cursed and all this stuff. He had to rest and try to cure himself so he could try to move better because he got slowed and, and, and couldn't move really well. Otherwise, I'm sure he would have come to try to help me fight the monsters and stuff like that. So that just worked out. And because I rolled really really well i was able to kill these monsters really well and I, I used my abilities used my companions all that stuff to help me fight so they really help one thing i didn't get to show you about the companions is again they um they will uh, uh be able to you'll be able to redirect damage to companions so as a scaling mechanic when you play with less characters you'll get companions and the companions are there to give you um, extra health so you can survive longer in the tomb if I was just one character with only 12 health, and I, I took the damage myself the whole time, but if one character with only 12 health, I would have to take all the damage, and uh, it would be much more difficult with less characters. But because you have companions, you can redirect damage to them. Um, Roger and Earl, they have 12 and then 17 health. You can put damage on them instead. If they take their full health, they'll actually die, and then you lose the companion, which is pretty interesting. So we have a question here. Um, Kliston, uh, hi. Hi. What components are compatible with all the expansions? For example, can you use any map tile from any expansion in any other one? Uh, the answer is almost all components uh, will work in, in mixing them together in the game. I say almost all because components like the bosses um, are usually never used in any other scenario. Um, currently, we don't have any um, scenarios that, that reuse bosses. We might create one which could be fun and interesting where you might get a random boss and crazy thing will happen, but that would probably be super imbalanced and uh, be a big problem. Uh, it would be probably something that would come up more thematically. So to answer your question better, um, when you have all the expansions, you can actually take all of the tiles, as many or as few as you want, and mix them in with the core game components. So you could have like over 120, 150 tiles in an epic stack um, and we're actually going to try to create a um, tile holder of some sort as a, a plastic tray-like component so that you can hold the tiles in there and randomize them. Um, and if you're looking for specific tiles, most scenarios will, uh, if they're specific, will they'll seed, will seed the tile earlier in the, um, in the top of the stack. So you'll find it a little bit sooner. So you don't have to search 100 tiles because that's not necessarily, necessarily fun. Or we'll give you a way to spawn the tile by finding other things in the game. And those will be mechanics that are put in the game because again, we want you to have fun and enjoy the game. We want you to have feel good moments. Some moments are gonna be, uh, you know, maybe bad things that happen in the game, but we want you to feel good when you're doing them. Again, you'll have all the tiles to mix into the game. You'll have artifacts, you'll have items, you'll have characters, uh, you'll have base creatures and elite creatures. Um, you might get new tomb cards. You'll get new story cards in the game. So there's a lot, a lot of things, maybe new status effects and they'll all mix in. And you'll get other things that'll spawn them. So it'll create tons and tons and tons of variation in the game as well. Uh, <clears throat> all right. So Jay said, is there a best player count? I can I play solo, but I normally play with two or three. Hand solo, not true solo. So honestly, the game plays great from one to six players. It's fully scalable no matter how many players you play. And that's because you're playing with six, excuse me, you're playing with 12 actions per round. So um, when you play with six players, each player gets two actions per round. The game still moves just as fast. It's just as engaging. Um, and when you take those actions, you actually have a benefit of being able to spread out. You have more characters to take damage, more characters to come into rooms and help do combat and stuff. Um, but when you play with lower player counts, you just get more actions per round for that character. So they get to do more stuff within that round with uh, less ability to technically move around. So um, it, it scales really, really well. And you also get, of course, get the companions. So there's no true, I would say there's no true best player count. I would say play with the amount of players that make it more fun for you. So if you enjoy playing solo, um, you can go ahead and uh, play solo and enjoy that. If you like playing and you want to play with a big group of six, it plays great with six as well. So I think that that's, that's always a good way. Um, one way to point that out here in the rule book, this is again, the older rule book with the older graphics. I'll show you. There's a little, uh, um, there's a little, I'll use my alt at the top there. It says adventurer setup. 
that little table there will show you how to set up for different numbers of players and it gives you uh, the different amount of actions you're supposed to take and companions and stuff like that which again scale the game for those numbers as well so that really helps out russ asks does search still remain uh, a character action option so again as i said we're changing how how the search works just to get rid of a couple of the little old school fiddly um component items and I'm going to play test the search deck, which is, believe it or not, is interesting. It's the original first version of search that I created uh, 10 years ago. That was a little like a little search deck. And if you decided to search, you'd spend an action, you draw a card and see what you potentially found. You might have to roll a die or do a check to see if you're able to find something in the room. I removed that um, back then and, and made it a different component. Uh, but I never really liked how it worked. I always felt like that. That action was just so extra and I wanted it to be a little bit more streamlined. So right now, a lot of the things you can do with search, you could do with the spirit mongers. You can spend spirits to buy items, to find things, to to cure yourself, to, to do different types of things in the game. They're there to make it easy and more accessible for you. And it's a reward for defeating creatures and doing things. So that's, that's a major part of the game. So um, the search will still probably be there, but it'll probably be there as a deck, which will just make the game a little easier. Um, uh, to uh, make that action a little bit more accessible and easier to use. Uh, let's see. Forum Lurker. That sounds like a new creature in the tomb. How does the removal of a search token affect the finding of items? So the search token would change uh, basically how difficult it was to find stuff, and it would change every round. And so uh, removing that will just make it so that it's more of a true random with possibly some kind of a check element in it. So the search card, you draw a search card on the search card. It would give you, um, let's say uh, it'll say you find an I uh, roll. Let's say roll knowledge to find an item. You'd roll knowledge. If you pass, you'd find the item. If you failed, maybe something else will happen. Or maybe depending on the number of sex successes you found, you would find a certain type of an item or you could search the item deck. So it'll, it'll be completely unique and different um, depending on what you're trying to do or what you possibly are searching for. Search cards might have options on them. So again, it'll be a little bit more thematic, a little bit more immersive, um, a little bit more interesting and just simpler. Having the little uh, the little token, everybody in the original version had a little token near them. You had to turn it every round. You had to remember to turn it. Other things could possibly change your search ability. Um, and it was just an extra thing that you could keep track of. So uh, we want to just be careful with making players keep track of too much stuff. One of our goals with this version of the game is to clean up how the player tracks their stuff. The original character sheet was a little bit more difficult to track everything. It had a lot of dials and things that can move and be jarred and stuff like that. So this version, we're trying to, I mean, we, we don't want to remove the cool stuff. We want to keep the immersive cool stuff, but we want to make it easier for the player to manage that cool stuff and easier to track. That's the goal. So we will uh, we'll make sure that the searching is more thematic and more immersive. Um, Undying Spite says, are you losing courage for each creature when using area combat? So area combat is um, one of those unique mechanics that is kind of a pressure luck. It is um, a very dangerous thing to do, but you can attack multiple things with multiple creatures. So you will definitely have to lose extra courage, but you'll have a chance to possibly defeat multiple creatures and save actions. So it's kind of that that plus or minus thing, you have to choose whether or not you wanted to go ahead and do that thing. Very few items currently have area combat in the game. We will be adding a few more interesting things. It usually is um, like a Tommy gun, machine gun type of things. Again, this is a pulp action adventure game. So we don't really have tons and tons of machine guns um, that exist as, as often that are easy to carry around in your hands. But we, we do go crazy. We're, we're, this is everything epic. So there's going to be uh, all kinds of machine guns and stuff that we'll put in. But they're just a little bit more rare than your everyday uh, regular weapon of some sort. Um, but yes, it is It is a little bit more, It's it's. you do lose more courage, you, you, you have a chance to take more damage, but you also get the chance to fight more creatures at once. So you want to do it when you're ready and when you have the, the power, to, so to speak, to be able to, to handle it. Um, Toretto, 1989, are you adding things to make the setup faster? So I think by... Um, Making the graphic design overall cleaner and tighter, it actually enhances making the setup faster. But the thing to note is, the most important thing is, every scenario has a different setup. So just looking in the old scenario book here, um, 
for the the Pharaoh with the blue eyes. The only setup we really had here is um, the uh, set aside the artifact cards, set aside the creature cards, and then the tomb was just level one, two, and three, which is the standard setup that's shown in the rulebook setup. In other scenarios, you'll see there will be other little things that you have to do. So for one if by land, two if by sea here, uh, it'll say like you have to set aside the revolutionary poltergeists, the two bosses, and then these tokens, and then you'll have to set aside a unique tile, um, and you get a specific artifact to the expeditionary leader. That's really the whole setup. And then again, standard setup, level one, level two, level three, and then your characters. So it's it's really setting up the components and the characters, but the setup really usually only takes maybe five, 10 minutes max-ish. Once you know how to play the game, the setup is not no more than five, 10 minutes. And it, and most of the time is players deciding what character they want to pick because there's so many cool characters to pick from. So that's honestly usually, um, from my experience, from running the game a thousand times, uh, the biggest thing that I think takes the longest is uh, players picking cool characters and then getting their items and putting all their stuff around their character. So five, 10 minutes max, maybe 15 minutes. Um, the, the, the hardest part I think would be is, um, picking which expansions you want as a part of your, your game. Once you have that all set up and in the all in box, we're going to have ways to, to store and mark what's in the box so that to make setup even faster, so you can just pull the stuff out of the box and put it on the table and use it. Um, the hardest, I think the hardest thing is going to be the kind of the pre setup setup is the, the, the owner of the game deciding what they want in their in their uh, gameplay, so to speak. So that's 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 kind of all based on your personal preferences. Um, punching the game is also going to be fun. That's going to be uh, the initial. If you get the all in and you decide to open up the whole game and you punch the whole thing at once, uh, it's it's going to be a lot of epic stuff. <laughs> that's going to take a little bit of time. I recommend getting a few friends together at that point if you're able, or just do it little by little. It's going to be a lot of content. It's it's a lot of stuff. Um, let's see what else. Is there a new version of Tabletop Simulator available? So this version we're using is just a demo version. Um, it does not have all the components in it. I created it just to run demos for everyone here uh, on um, GameFound and for, for, for our fans who want to see what's going on in the game. So we made this version just for you guys to see. Uh, we're going to probably update this version and then put it out once we have the final new scenario book and the new rule book and stuff so that you guys can try out the game with a couple of scenarios as we're working over the next year, finishing up the rest of the game. So I'll put it out a little bit after the campaign once we have the content um, ready for you guys to play a little bit better. Um, of course, there'll be a caveat where it's like, listen, this could possibly change as we final develop stuff and perfect stuff. So keep that in mind. But the goal is to get this out to you a little bit after the campaign so you can play around and, and try out the game, learn the game. So when it shows up at your front door, you, you could just crack it open and play. Let's see. Um, will the game tokens be of plastic or the same quality as the original? So um, the game tokens, most of them will be in heavy duty, nice cardboard card stock. Um, and the, the, uh, clamshells here these open and close you know to hold the character sheet in them so you'll you open it up you put a character sheet inside which will be like a nice card stock you close it and then it'll line up with all the stuff on it um the components overall we're trying to just really improve the quality the dice we want the readability and the contrast between the colors and the icons to be really good they're not going to be black and white like you see here but this is the easiest to see in my opinion here on tabletop simulator um we're going to again our goal is to upgrade pretty much everything in the game. The quality of the original game from 10 years ago to the, to the new version of the game, we want everything to be better. The trays, I want them to be nice and heavy duty and really usable so they'll hold up over time. So the trays you have in all of the versions of the game, I want them to be really nice. So um, there will be cardboard cards, the plastic stands and everything that hold the characters. This is not a really exact representation of what the plastic stands will look like. This is just what Tabletop Simulator has, but you'll get plastic stands. And then of course, we have, and I have one on my desk here, the uh, the plastic um, tomb dials, I'm calling them. I don't know if you could see that. Okay. Uh, I don't have amazing lighting right now in here, but you can see the tomb dial. This is just like the one of the version ones here with the dials on it. We're, we're messing with them to make them to make them work even better. This is for a boss. So this is nice and big here with Razazul on it. 
but um, there will be smaller versions for the regular creatures and the elite creatures, so you can track their health without having to put tokens down. We didn't track any health in this demo because I uh, apparently one-shot at everybody, but when you track health, you would um, use one of these tokens here uh, and put them next to the creatures as you're tracking their health, so that's how that works. Um, and the card quality is going to be also important to us. Um, usually we use like a, a, a German or a blue core type of a card. Um, we don't like heavy gloss cards, uh, but uh, I might potentially go with the linenized. I'll have to try it out and see what's most readable. So I always try to get some samples of cards to get what's really nice and readable and, and what works really well with a nice snap. So they don't get bendy. They just snap down. A lot of people are asking about uh, sleeving their cards and, and that kind of thing. And, and um, you know, uh, that makes sense. So we're going to try to be, we're going to test our, our card stands and stuff like that, our, our, our plastic card stands that we're making um, and the new card stands that go in the core game to make sure that they hold sleeves and stuff like that for players who want to want to sleeve up. All right, so that looks to be like our last question right now. Again, thank you very much, everybody, for, for tuning in and checking out the demo. If you're interested in seeing more, if you want me to run a full game if you'd like to see multiple people playing um whatever you want to see you let us know uh here at everything epic we listen to you we want to do what you would like to see and what you would like to do um so you know put in the comments on the game found what you'd like to see uh here on stream if you want us to stream more stuff show off demos um, do different combats do full games let us know uh again sam healy from the uh, flip side of board gaming formerly of the Dice Tower. Our friend Sam is going to be running a full game this Friday. Uh, well, I guess that's tomorrow. Uh, coming up, he's going to be running a full game uh, with uh, his friends. Um, I think one of his friends and then his wife as well. So they're going to be running a full game tomorrow at, I believe, 1 p.m. Pacific time, which is going to be uh, 3 Central for Eastern. Not sure what the European translation to that is, uh, but they'll be running one tomorrow. Um, tomorrow also is Veterans Day, so to all the veterans out there, thank you very much for your service. And uh, if you are a veteran and you're off from work, or maybe you have to still work, but you want to take a break and you want to tune into that, go right ahead and tune in and you can check that out. But of course, we will also be uh, getting that as a video version too. So if you can't tune in, we'll put out the video version of that uh, full gameplay as well. Um, I'm going to be watching that chat so I can help him out with any rules that might come up. And if you see a rule, like Russ, if you tune in and you see something that comes up in the in that chat, feel free to go ahead and let them know kindly. Uh, hey, uh, here, you know, maybe you missed turning a token or something like that. But they're going to play a physical, the physical prototype version. Um, it's going to look a little different from what you see here. He might have some old components mixed in. I sent him some other stuff to use so he can have a pretty good, fun, full game. So, again, uh, tune into that tomorrow if you want. And again, let us know what you want to see. Send out some comments. And again, thank you so much for all of your epic support here in uh, in our game found for Secrets of the Lost Tomb. It means a whole lot to us. Uh, again, we're a small company. We want to make really epic games for you. So thanks for your support. We can't make these games without your help. So again, thank you. And um, we'll be back with some more streaming and some more stuff later on um, at other, uh, other on other days during the campaign, after the campaign, we'd love to do some more stuff for you. So again, thanks so much. And uh, we'll see you and talk to you again soon. Have a good one.